One of the things I love about Alaska is I'm going, I'm experiencing, I'm fishing in a place that hasn't been screwed up yet, right? Still pristine, beautiful, perfect, really. If you go middle of Bristol Bay, it would look the same as it did to you 100 years ago, 200 years ago, right? And that's the same feeling I get in the Everglades. You know, like you, you wouldn't know what time period you're in essentially, right? But the Everglades has been suffering due to man's impact. Now gone Building a levee in the lake, restricting the flow through the glades, like we have screwed it up from what it could be. As good as it is, it could be better. And just seeing, seeing and fishing in Alaska and knowing how good it is now, like I would hate to be telling my kids about like the days before pebble mine, you know, before the water got polluted, you know, I mean, there's a lot of places in the world to dig for gold. Bristol Bay isn't one of them. Ah, how would I describe John Landry? You talking about John Landry? He might forget to tie his shoes in the morning or uh, kind of cool, quiet. He doesn't, he doesn't say much, but when he says something, it carries weight. I don't know, seemed like a pretty interesting dude, seemed like a pretty fishy dude. He's the godfather, I think. I mean, everybody treats him that way. John's somebody that everybody around here respects. He, he's a hell of a fisherman. He's passionate about what he does, and you know, he's, he's just a good dude. You're, you're fishing with a good person, a guy that's conservation-minded. He'll go out, it's not just for the dollar bills. He'll go there if the weather's wrong, the tide's gonna be crappy, there's not gonna be a chance of you catching a fish, he'll tell you. And he'll say, you make the decision. We can still go, but it's not gonna be good. You know, and a lot of people won't do that, you know? Uh, so I respect that. John Landry. I'm a fishing guide out of Fort Myers Beach. Uh, I fish for just about everything depending on time of year, but my favorite thing to do be tarpon fishing. Fish in Alaska in the summertime. I fish on the Alagnac River, Bristol Bay. Fish for rainbow trout, all five species Pacific salmon. Um, it was John who made me feel like I could catch a fish. Tell me about when the tarpon grabbed your crab. It was a miracle? How did you pull them in? Easy. Going around. It, it was just never a thought to stay inside and watch videos or play gaming TVs. There was no, no choice what we were doing on a Saturday or a Sunday or after school or on vacations. We were outside. Take that, you dog, you gorgeous. What do you think about uh, fishing with Dad? Well, hey, if you want to pull this thing, you're welcome to any minute. We've got a 75 year old guy up pulling the boat, and he's standing on the front. Real, real like crazy. By about age nine, he was treating me like I was a you know 25 year old professional on the bass tour. You know, <laughs> I think he was probably eight or nine, nine years old. Doing, he'd come along on the turns, and me and I was crazy. Okay, you know, we put our time in, and we're pretty serious about it. You know, this is what they call fun. You got to be quiet. You can't move around. You can't wear bright colors. Um, I thought, well, Jeepers, this, drop me off on a beach somewhere. Well, you'd say, okay, I knew where the fish would be, and I'd say, John, cast in that hole right over there, and he'd throw it in the other hole, you know, because he wanted to, thinking there'd be something, he, he did it his way a lot, which is fine, you know, he had his ways of doing things, but. And then Dad said, Snook, over there, 11 o'clock. And then he said, I don't want 
cast to it. So I give it to Dad. Why didn't you want to cast to it, John? I was afraid I'd get it in the tree. Yes! Now he teaches me. <laughs> hey, Dad, what would you like to do? You want to pull or you want to fish? Said, I'll pull. I shouldn't have even been asked. He should have just said, okay, the rod's down there. No, I know you get nervous about fishing on camera. Nobody else I'd rather grow up fishing with, that's for sure. He loves the Everglades. Uh, the thing that he loves, <laughs> I think, is terrific. <laughs> that's the one fish that he's kind of keyed in on. You know, because you can't be good at everything. But, you know, you can, you can specialize in something. And I realized that, like, I wanted to, I wanted to be good at Southwest Florida tarpon fishing. Just real, Gary. Just real. Stay tight on the motor at the fish. I mean, dude, there's nothing like a tarpon. It's it's insane. It's it's absolutely insane. I mean, like, I like you hook into a you know 100, 120 pound fish with a tight drag, and it's just ripping and throws water all over you, and freaking takes off, and you know, jumping, going crazy, and basically like a five gallon bucket open up in front of your face. You're catching someone in a fish of a lifetime. You see the impact that fish has on somebody? I don't see that in anything else I do. Maybe like a, a huge trout in Alaska, but... So a lot of people who've never been to the Everglades really don't understand why it's so important to, to tarpon fishing. Um, and the simple answer is it is the most important juvenile tarpon location for the tarpon population in the, in the U.S. The approach of Bonefish Tarpon Trust is to understand how tarpon use habitats and how changes to those habitats or water affect their movements. And the best way to do that is with tracking them. And current technology called acoustic telemetry allows us to track individual fish for five or six years at a time. These are the tags that we surgically implant into tarpon, about the size of a AA battery. So what we do is we'll catch the tarpon, we pull them into a sling, measure them, length and girth, turn them over so they're belly side up, pull a couple scales off, and then make an incision just wide enough to stick this tag in. Each of these points is a place where an acoustic receiver has picked it up. So you can see with this one fish, it's using that entire area and it does this year after year. Um, so you can see that connectivity. This one is just in Florida, but it shows you the importance at a really fine scale of the Florida Everglades to the, the fishery wherever you find tarpon, whether it be from Mississippi all the way to Chesapeake Bay. Everglades is kind of that, that kernel, that central point uh, that makes it all possible. So when those tarpon are done spawning and they start migrating north to feed on sardines or menhaden or mullet or whatever it is, if there's a disruption to that feeding, um, they're going to be hurting for it because that's kind of them putting the feed bag on. Just like you see the, the bears in Alaska feeding on the salmon, that lasts them for much of the year. It's the same with tarpon. And so tarpon have, give us leverage to give 
conservation that benefits a lot of other species. So if people like to go um, birding and like wading birds, that's juvenile tarpon habitat. By protecting that, by using tarpon um, as, as kind of our umbrella species, we're protecting a lot of other uh, species that are out there. If you take a place that's salt water and you suddenly dump a lot of fresh water in there, like dumping water out the Coosahatchee River, you kill things. It's an immediate death. You kill the seagrass, you kill the oysters, you kill a lot of the crabs, a lot of the fish, all these things that tarpon and, and snook depend on. So it's that immediate effect of changing freshwater flows that is most concerning short term. And then second, longer term, legacy effects is the contaminants and nutrients and pollutants that are in there that will be with us for years, if not decades. I think conservation in America is, I think conservation in America is, that's the right way of saying that. I guess I, th I think conservation in America has been done wrong for a very long time. And the proof of that is today, there are significantly less opportunities for a sportsman to go out and experience fisheries, areas to hunt, than 20 years ago. Oh, you son of I started fishing the glades with my dad. And uh... we always fished out of Flamingo. And our intention was go to go there because the fishing was so unbelievably good for redfish and, you know, just everything. It was just a phenomenal fishery. And I'll always remember it. The fishing was good everywhere back then. It really was. But that was just special. It was neat. You're away from everybody. It was true wild fishing, you know. So many things you've seen. So many stories long forgotten. The one thing I noticed this time going back, it's really kind of depressing, is the grass is gone. The grass is, is gone. It's just mud bottom. And I was really pleasantly surprised at the number of fish that are still there. They figure it out, which is a, a great deal. But I can only imagine if that grass was still there. Back then, the water would come in through the grass and just acted as a filter. and. But, uh, you know, it's, it's still not bad. It's just completely different than back then. As bright as lightning bulbs and jars All beneath the canopy They just Going back about 100 years, changes were made to the water management system in Florida. The system was manipulated and, and changed. Lake Okeechobee was dammed. Areas that were swamped were turned into dry ground. And that flow of water that historically fed the river of grass and balanced Florida Bay no longer can do so. The Everglades today only gets one third of the amount of fresh water that it needs. If we can return the flow of fresh water to the Everglades, we can fix these problems. You're seeing these you know, results of that water being managed, not for the benefit of the ecosystem, but for the benefit of you know, whatever politics at the time decides. These places can recover. We saw the proof of that with Hurricane Irma. A massive amount of fresh water was put into that system in the Southern Everglades, and the result was a little window of recovery. I, mean, I don't even know why I'm casting it's out of it here. The only reason there's that many fish in there right now is Irma put so much water on the landscape, on the glades. It drained in and fed all those feeder creeks. And the fish, after Irma spawned, they all went up in those creeks and survived. They had the biggest crop of snook and reds that they've seen in Florida Bay in like 50 years. It just goes to show us if we can return the flow of water south to the Everglades, the natural system will recover.
But it's amazing how resilient Mother Nature is. I mean, like you have, I mean, like we cut off flow to the Everglades, right? And I mean, like, look at how much life is still here. You know, I mean, all the birds, all the fish, all the tarpon. Just imagine what it would be like, you know, if it was how it was supposed to be. <clears throat> but it's cool to think about, you know, and to know that I might see that, you know? I mean, like next time, you know, like me and you might come in here, you know, 10, 20 years later, and we're fishing in here and this water's clean, full of grass. It just shows you the water is the lifeblood of Florida. It is. You need that good, clean water for everything. I don't care what it is, you know. This is purely a function of what's been done by government diverting na natural flows of water. It shows you. You can't do it. Where you have a situation like Pebble Mine in Bristol Bay where the obvious solution to benefit the most number of people is no Pebble Mine never, right? And so that's the same as our situation here. You know, like the solution that's going to benefit the most people is to restore the Everglades 100%. How do you feel about Pebble Mine? No Pebble Mine. No, no Pebble, Pebble Mine. mine. Coming from Florida, I didn't know what Pebble Mine was. Like, I didn't even know what Bristol Bay was, you know? Like, let alone right. the, the biggest threat to it. Kill Quake Traffic Fever 00. We're about five west. We'll be flying up the river and landing to Kill Quake. freshwater community, right, like the freshwater fly fishing world, Alaska is their Everglades, their Florida, their tarpon fishing, you know, like that's where everyone wants to get to is the Bristol Bay trout fishery, right? Honest to God, it was the first day I went trout fishing, the first spot I was at, first fish I caught was just within a couple casts and it all clicked. I, was, I totally got it, you know? Like. <laughs> Honestly, if I had one day left, God said, Landry, you got one day left. What do you want to do? I'm trout fishing in Bristol Bay. I don't know the names of the bugs and stuff, you know. <laughs> Landry, what's this pattern I'm using? Uh, brown caddis. Oh, is it? <laughs> that looks like a looks like a royal wolf where we fished. Yeah, you know, it depends where you are. Some people call it different things, you know. Like, I don't know what it is, sir. I just know if you tie it on and you throw it right there, you're gonna catch a fish. pick up on all the little things, right? And so coming up here, as a guide, like you look at this environment, like this river, and you just know, like, like you're, I'm looking at something that's totally pristine, it's perfect, it works, it hasn't been, it hasn't been manipulated by man. And you're gonna jeopardize that? You're gonna threaten that? For what gain? Gold, copper, 
We don't need more gold. We need more wild places like Bristol Bay. If you look at Bristol Bay, you know, we have two major river systems that feed into Bristol Bay. And between those two rivers, they produce half the world's sockeye salmon. So if, if you follow those rivers upstream, almost as far up as they can go, that's where the pebble deposit is. And the pebble deposit is 11 billion tons. It's, hu it's huge. As soon as you have all of the support systems in place to sort, support pebble, it becomes really easy for all those other smaller mining claims to move forward. And then we're talking about an industrial mining district in the heart of Bristol Bay. At 160,000 metric tons per day, the first deposit that we've discovered that pebble, and there will be more, but the first one lasts 180 years. Bristol Bay is, you know, looks really big on the map, but it's not, it's a small area when you really look at it as far as, you know, if you were to pollute that area, you're polluting hundreds and hundreds of, maybe thousands of miles of rivers. All these rivers are interconnected by the bay. When you look at what a mine like that could do to the ecosystem in that um, 2014, they had a mine called Mount Polly in British Columbia. And that tailing pond that was holding the arsenic back had a major breach and it destroyed its entire river system below the dam. When it comes to an environmental disaster at a mine, few top this. 10 million cubic meters of water in a tailing pond suddenly broke free, sending tons of mud, sand, and debris into a tiny creek, which became a torrent and flowed into Pinnell Lake. That mine failure and that breach as recently as 2014 wasn't enough. When is enough common sense when you start thinking about it? When is that gonna, when is that gonna sink in? So if, if something goes wrong at Pebble, and let's just, let's just say it's not something catastrophic, even if there isn't a you know, wall of toxic waste coming down the river, very small changes in water chemistry can affect the salmon's ability to spawn. Salmon make life happen out here. And the return of the salmon to the river systems every year since their, their life cycle where they spawn, they die, decay, provide all that nutrient and, and you know, biomass of, of protein for not only the, the the trout, but also the grayling, the bears, the, the birds, the eagles, the, the osprey. It just, you know, it keeps going on and on. Uh, and then you have the economic piece of it, is you have, you know, the salmon feed the rainbow trout, and the rainbow trout and the salmon bring anglers and outdoor enthusiasts from all over the world. And then on top of that, there's the commercial salmon fishery that you know, it's 14,000 jobs and a $1.5 billion economy that, you know, if we take care of the fish, that will happen every year. Leave it alone and you're supporting more families and you're supporting more people in general, just in the entire region with what's already going on right now. I don't think they can. I think that's, that's the problem. Once you mess this up, it, you can't get it back. And that's, I think that's our opportunity here in Bristol Bay is that we have the chance to get the wild salmon story right. We have the chance to learn from mistakes of the lower 48 and get it right and, and, and prove that, you know, by simply taking care of the salmon and their habitat, that we can support a thriving tourism and, and sport fishing industry. We can keep a culture that exists nowhere else in the world thriving. We just, we just have to leave it alone.
I take pride in that, that like I go out every day and like I have the opportunity to show somebody this environment. To the point where you're not, like I'm not even concerned about the fishing because like you can have a slow day of fishing and just like being here and being in the environment makes up for it. I think that fishermen should think about conservation the same way they think about fishing. The more you know about the fish that you're going for, the more you're going to be in the right place at the right time and the more fish you're going to catch. I consider it paying dues. Just like you got to explore places to find out where the fish are, you got to get involved because um, no one else is going to take care of it for you. people that are the that are making the policy decisions that affect you know these wild places that have never even been there. I mean I think that's what a lot of people in the industry and outdoorsmen get fired up about is you know you have people making decisions for your wild places that you care for so much and they've never even experienced them. In the past it's always been like fighting a losing battle and this is the first year where it's like you know it felt like we're actually gaining ground. I think there's an incredible amount of people power. People have set aside their differences and come together and said no. And I think that is why we've had success. It's going to take a lot of people getting involved, using their voice to speak up for their issue, and really coming together and supporting each other. I think the more you can tell people that aren't aware of it, you know, people, not everybody has a chance to go out on a boat. You know, they could live out in, off the water somewhere and not be fortunate enough to live in Florida or ever get around water, but they can still be part of the solution as well as the problem. So letting those people know, and that's where social media comes in, telling the people on the boat about these water issues, explaining to them about what Pebble Mine can do and that you can do something. So I hope that that would be one thing that always happens, the, being a good communicator of a problem, and understanding the issues, and knowing that it is driven by government. You, you gotta have the government behind it. They can either fix it or they can just say no. Here's my son at four years old with his dad and one of our best friends. And here he is with his dad at, you know, 25 years old. They're still doing the same thing. I, I, I want this for his children and my daughter's children and my grandchildren. I want that for them. We can't rely on these special places, these special iconic places being there 10 or 15 or years from now or a generation from now if we don't actively participate in their future. Yeah, there, there is no choice. We have to do something. We have to do something fast. We, we can't afford to lose more wild places. We need to stand together. We need to be the opposition. We need to protect and be the voice for these lands that are so special to everyone.
trying to make sense of nonsense that I've called my life. It's only this river can bear me to safety. Only this river. Can bear me away. See them all work and play. They're on the other bank, warm in their houses. While I face my cold alone, guess I've been drinking away to keep the wolves of my mind at bay. Don't know if I've ever killed all the drone batteries, but if you run, you die. I'm just too tired to care. 